right, so welcome to part two of this video. If you have not watched part one, go find and watch part one. So in part one, we said that when you buy into an IPO, you either buy it as a trade, as a speculative trade, or as an investment. And if you're going into it as a trade, then you want to get in at the offer price. To do that, you have to be a high net worth individual because you buy the offer price, there's a high chance, there's a first day pop, you get out at a quick profit. But if you want to buy on the first day and hoping to make some money, it's a gamble. It's a 50-50. You might as well go to the casino and throw the dice because you can see that, you know, boom or bust, tech IPOs or any IPOs, they can go either way. They could, you know, they could go up or they could go down. It's, it's basically a gamble. This is, this is another example. These are the mega IPOs in 2019 of last year. You can see that since it IPO'd, all right, one, two, three, four, five. Five of them are below the IPO price, like Uber, Lyft, uh, Pinterest, Smile Direct Club, and Taoyi International Holdings. And about um, five of them um, uh, are up above the IPO price. You've got Aventor, you have got XP, you've got Peloton. You've got trade web markets and Chewy. So again, it's it's a coin flip. It's a coin flip, okay? But if you want to invest in an IPO, uh, hold it over the years, then you have to understand the business. You have to analyze the business. Is it a good business? And so we talked a bit about uh, what are the factors we looked at in analyzing a good business. So in part two of this video, uh, we'll be going to in depth. I'll be showing you a case study of a new IPO Snowflake, a very much hyped up IPO, and we'll see whether it's something worthwhile to invest in, and is it at an, an attractive price right now, or even an IPO. Now, even if you do find a very good business, like for example, I mentioned Visa. Visa was one of the few great companies uh, that I bought post-IPO. So even before it IPO'd, it had a great track record of increasing sales and profits. It has a great brand, a great competitive advantage, right? And we know that you know Facebook turned out really well, Amazon turned out really well. These were great IPOs that eventually succeeded. But I'm here to tell you that even if you do find a great business, you don't have to buy on the first day. You don't even have to buy it on the first week or the first month. In fact, what I found through research is that it is actually better to buy it only after a few months or even after a few years. You usually get it at a much better price. I like to quote uh, Warren Buffett. And this is the reason why Warren Buffett very, very rarely invests in IPOs. And he said in his 1993 letter to shareholders, an intelligent investor in common stocks will do better in the secondary market than he will do buying new issues. So what he's saying is that instead of buying shares from uh, the company at IPO, buy shares once it's been trading on the stock market for a while, right? Because the market is ruled by controlling stockholders and corporations who can usually select the timing of offerings or if the market looks unfavorable, can avoid an offering altogether. Understandably, these sellers are not going to offer any bargains, either by way of public offering or in a negotiated transaction. So what he's saying is this. See, to make money as an investor, you always want to buy something when it's under value. You want to pay less than what it's worth. And you can never get that in an IPO because in an IPO, the founders of the company, the ones who are selling the shares to you, they know the business better than you. And they always want to sell at the highest price they can get it at. So you're never going to get a good deal. You can only get a good deal only when the company has been listed on the market for some time and you have an event like a trade war or a you know, pandemic where the share price crashes. And that's the window of opportunity to buy that great business at a discount. So very rarely at an IPO. In fact, like I said, if you look at previous IPOs that became great companies, uh, like look at Facebook, for example. You can always get a better price if you wait a while and not jump the gun and get in because of FOMO, the fear of missing out. So Facebook actually went IPO on 18 May 2012. This was about eight years ago, right? 
and the offer price was $38. So in other words, those big guys, they bought it at $38. Good for them, okay? When the shares opened, it opened at about $42, right? So yep, they, there was a first day pop, as you can see, first day pop. So again, if you was like a for trade, could have sold at 42, make some money, get up, right? But subsequently, what happened? Although Facebook turned out to be a great business, but temporarily from uh, $42, it went all the way down to $17.55, way below the offer price. So again, if you are patient, you could have bought it at like a 50% discount to those big institutions, okay? And you know, over time, you can see Facebook is now a great business. Another example would be uh, Visa, which I mentioned, right? So Visa, by the way, Visa had a stock split. So what I'm showing you here are the share prices adjusted after the stock split. Okay, so uh, Visa went IPO on the 19th of March, 2008. That was about 12 years ago, right? And the offer price was $11, um, adjusting for the stock split. So what happened? On the first day, the stock was listed, it opened at 1488. So there was a pretty good one day pop, all right? And again, you may say, hey, I didn't get a chance to get it in $14. I couldn't get in at 11 bucks, you know, because I'm not a big guy. Don't worry. Again, what happened? After the initial pop, it slammed down to $10. Okay, before going to the moon and becoming and continuing to uh, increase in value. So the point is this, don't rush into an IPO. Always wait a few months, even a few years for the business to prove itself for it to show consistent growth in sales and profits because you can always get in at a better price. The first day's price is not always the best price as shown in these many examples. So let's take a look at a recent IPO on the 15th of September, 2020, uh, known as Snowflake, ticker symbol S-N-O-W. So this um, IPO was really, really uh, hyped up and um, one of the reasons is because it is backed by Salesforce.com and it was, um, reported that Berkshire Hathaway took a stake in this business, which is very, very rare for Berkshire to take a stake in an IPO company as Warren Buffett has often said in the past that he avoids IPO. So of course, the media plays it up and says, you know, Warren Buffett is buying Snowflake. So that created a lot of hype and everyone wanted to get into Snowflake because of that. Now, be very careful when you read um, these things in the media because a lot of these things you read are distorted. Okay, um, first of all, it is not Warren Buffett himself that made this investment. It was Berkshire Hathaway. And more likely than not, it was made by his lieutenants and not Buffett himself. So be very careful when you hear that, oh, Buffett bought this. It's not, he didn't buy it. Now, uh, when Snowflake uh, listed, the share price doubled on the first day. So you can imagine the, the demand was a lot more than the supply of the share. So it's the biggest software IPO ever. Now, it is unlikely unless you are a high net worth individual, your preferred broker, that you could have gotten in at the offer price. If you had, then great, you'd have made a lot of money on the first day pop, okay? But for most normal people, like I said in the previous video, um, you will not be able to get in on the offer price. You would only be able to buy on that first day of trading in the markets. And would it have been a good idea to do that? <laughs> Not really, okay? So again, let's take a look at the business behind a stock. Is it a business that is worth investing in, in the long run? And if it is, is it at a, an attractive price right now, okay? So again, you have to read the prospectus. You have to do your research, find out all about the business to understand uh, what the business is all about. So Snowflake is a cloud-based data warehouse as a service company. So its main product is a data warehouse service that can be set up and run quickly and out of the box, completely hosted on the cloud. And who are their customers? Their customers are basically small startup companies and mid-sized tech companies that prefer to pay for on-demand data warehousing and processing rather than 
building up their own data centers, which they can't afford if they are a small, medium-sized company. All right. Now, when I first read that, I said, okay, but aren't a lot of other companies already doing that? Okay. Aren't there a lot of uh, you know big players in the cloud computing space? And of course, there are. So who are Snowflake's competitors? Okay. So their big competitors would be Google BigQuery, which runs on Google Cloud Platform, owned by, of course, Alphabet. Their competitors would also include Microsoft SQL Server that runs on Microsoft Azure, if that's how you pronounce it. And they also compete with Amazon's Redshift, which, which runs on Amazon Web Services or AWS. So they've got all these big competitors. Now, the thing about Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon is that of course, they're in other businesses like, you know, Amazon's in e-commerce and Microsoft is in software and Alphabet's in search, all right? So this um, data warehousing and analysis service is only a small part of their businesses, okay? So in fact, cloud is uh, only makes up about 17% of Amazon's revenue, but about 80% of their operating income, okay? So in a way, they are not direct competitors of Snowflake, but they have a major business that competes with Snowflake. The closest competitor that Snowflake has that does you know, basically that, that niche only would be Cloudera, ticker symbol CLDR. So this would be Snowflake's main competitors. Now it's really important because when you invest in a business, you only want to invest in a business that has little or no competition, that dominates its industry. That's how you are sure that in the long run, they're able to grow their sales, profits, and cash flow without being disrupted by competitors. So uh, when I read this, I was a bit concerned about the major competition that they are facing, okay? At the same time, Snowflake also partners with these competitors. So they're not just competitors, they're also partners of Snowflake, right? Why? Because Snowflake, builds their service on their cloud infrastructures, infrastructure, right? So Snowflake uses uh, Microsoft, Amazon, and Alphabet's products, which is their cloud infrastructure, to serve as uh, the infrastructure to its own products, okay? Now, I asked a friend who's really more of a techie guy. I'm not really a techie guy, so I don't really know the technical details. And I said, you know, explain to me, um, What's the difference? Why would a company go to Snowflake instead of going to Amazon and Google where they also provide the same cloud enterprise solutions? And the best example he could give would be, all right, so Amazon is like, you know, they're providing you with the Lego bricks, you know, Lego, and you build your own car, you build your own helicopter, right? But Snowflake, they make it a lot more user-friendly, a lot more, uh, it's a lot easier to set up and it's out of the box solutions, which means that Snowflake, they build the car out of Lego bricks or they build a helicopter and you use what suits you as a company, right? So basically Snowflake's whole business is built on the infrastructure of these other big players, right? So you gotta understand uh, that's their business model. Now looking at the financials, like what I mentioned, the big risk about buying a new company is that you don't have much track record, right? It's like dating, you know, a virgin, right? A virgin guy, a virgin girl, you know, they don't have much experience, okay? So, you know, will they make a good uh, wife or husband or lover in the long run? You don't know. You're taking a big gamble, okay? You're hoping that they do and you're buying a promise that one day they're going to make money, okay? So if you look at Snowflake's revenue, it's only two years of records you know you know two years doesn't mean very much okay but of course you can see revenue uh double over the last financial year so that that gets people like oh revenue doubles but can they grow at the same rate it's hard to say because there's a lot of diminishing returns but let's granted that they are growing at like 80 percent sales revenue now their net profit you can see it's negative so they are you know losing more money this year than last year which is understandable because if it's a new company, they have not reached economies of scale yet, they are losing money, but the hope is, you know, one day, one day they will make money, all right? There's nothing wrong. Like Amazon lost money for seven years before they made money. Facebook lost money for five to six years before they made money, right? 
But it doesn't mean that Snowflake can do that. So we have to look into more of the, the business, right? It's sustainable, okay? One thing I like about Snowflake is that they have got a lot more cash than debt, okay? So uh, the debt structure is pretty conservative, but again, they're not making money yet. You can see their net income is negative and obviously their cash flow is negative as well. So what is Snowflake's main competitive advantage? Why would customers use their service instead of going straight to Amazon Web Services or uh, Microsoft's Azure, right? Their main uh, advantage or their product offering or their USP, unique selling proposition, is that they allow the separation of data storage and data processing. The storage and the analysis is separated out. So this gives the customer a lot more flexibility in selecting the right level of service for them with faster response times when needed to scale up or scale down their business. So that's their main advantage, right? But the question is, is it sustainable? Most important thing when you invest in a business is that their competitive advantage has to be sustainable so that the competitors cannot easily replicate or disrupt their business model and take away their customers. In the case of Snowflake, my opinion is that their competitive advantage is not sustainable. They do not have a narrow or wide economic moat. Why? Because the big players like Amazon, Alphabet, and Microsoft can easily, if they want to invest money to transform their offerings to have the same capabilities as Snowflake. Now, not only that, but remember that Snowflake is sharing the same cloud infrastructure as Amazon Web Services, Google, and Azure by Microsoft. So if Amazon, Google, and Microsoft feel threatened by Snowflake and they want to play bastard, okay, they could easily alter their platforms to screw Snowflake. Right, so that their snowflake will melt into water and they are gone. Right? So because of that, when I looked at it, I said, well, I don't think I'm going to you know, want to invest in something like that. Okay? So if you ask me as a business itself, I don't think it's a great business. I think it's in a very competitive industry. I don't think they've got a solid moat. Now, even if I do believe it's a good business, but is it selling at, at, an, at an attractive price? Remember that a great business can be a lousy investment if you pay too high a price for it, if it's overvalued. But a great business can be a great investment if you pay an attractive price. So it's all about the price that you pay. So let's take a look at the share price right now. Is it overvalued, is it undervalued, or, or is it fairly priced? So how do we estimate the fair value of the share of a company? Usually, I would use the discounted cash flow method, which is to project all the future cash flow generated by the business and discount it to present value. But you can't use this method with a company like SNOW because there's no consistent growth in cash flow yet. The second method is to use PE ratio, price to earnings ratio, and compare that to competitors. Now, you can't use that either because there's no E, there's no earnings. So PE ratio is undefined. So for companies with uh, negative earnings or making losses, but with huge uh, growth potential in revenue, the only way to value it is using the price to sales ratio. So the price to sales ratio, basically you take the share price divided by the revenue per share to get the price to sales ratio. So the higher the price to sales ratio, the more expensive it is, the lower, the cheaper it is. So let's compare Snow to its closest competitors. So we mentioned Amazon, Alphabet, Microsoft, and CLDR, which is the most direct competitor. Now you can see that Snow's current share price is at 238, Amazon's at 3002, Alphabet at 1005, Microsoft at 215, CLDR at $11. Now you can't look at the absolute price to determine if it's expensive or cheap. So a $3,000 share could be cheaper than a $200 share depending on its fair value, okay? So the way to, again, measure the value is price to sales ratio. Now take a look at this. You can see that for our three 
big tech companies, the price to sales ratio is 4.97, 6, and 11. So based on this metric, you can see that the cheapest stock is actually Amazon, followed by Alphabet, and the most expensive one right now is Microsoft, based on the price to sales ratio. CLDR is the cheapest at four times. But look at Snow. Snow's price to sales ratio is currently at 165 times. That is insane. Okay, that's insane. Now, you could argue that, hey, they deserve a higher value because of their higher growth rate. Fair enough. So we have to look at the projected growth rate of the company. What growth rate is the revenue growing at? Okay, so once we know the growth rate, we can calculate the price to sales growth ratio, or known as PSG ratio. So this ratio is where we take the price to sales ratio and we divide it by the projected growth rate to get the PSG ratio. So the lower the ratio, the more undervalued the, the, the share price is. Does this make sense? So what's a rough guide? Okay, rough guide is this. When a company has a PSG ratio of 0 0.2, it's considered fairly priced. Not expensive, not cheap. If it's below 0 0.2, it's undervalued. And above 0 0.2, it is overvalued. That's a rough estimate. Now, if you take a look at all these companies, they are all above 0 0.2. But at least Amazon is not that far away. It's like 0 0.33, which is okay, a bit overvalued based on price to sales. Alphabet, 0 0.41, a bit overvalued. Microsoft, you know, pretty expensive above that. CLDR is similar to Amazon and Alphabet, but look at Snow's PSG ratio. It's 3.5, okay? So that's really, really expensive. So based on this, what would be a reasonable price to pay for Snow? Okay, so there are a few ways to look at it, right? Number one, you could say, okay, if you compare Snow with the rest of them, uh, let's take the highest. So the highest with Microsoft. Microsoft selling at 1.17, okay? And this guy selling at 3.5, which means in order for Snow to be as attractively priced as Microsoft, which is really the most expensive, you have to make sure that Snow's share price drops by two thirds, All right? Does it make sense? So if the share price drops by two thirds, then the PSG ratio would go to about one, which is about Microsoft's valuation. So if you take 238, divide it by three, that gives you a share price of $80. Okay, so what, and I'm, what am I saying? I'm saying that the highest price that someone should pay for snow, which is reasonable, the highest price, the most expensive, would be $80. That's right. Now, if you're looking at me and say, Adam, are you crazy? It's not at two, three, eight. Are you saying it's gonna to drop to 80? I'm not saying that because it may not drop because of the hype, right? As long as there's hype, it could still go up. But I'm telling you that as an investor, it does not make sense to pay more than $80 per share for snow based on its current growth rate in its revenue, okay? In fact, I did some digging <clears throat> and I found that initially, when Snow was going to go IPO, the investment bank decided to price the shares at guess. That's right. The original offer price they were going to sell the shares at was $75 to $85. Think about it. Which means that the, the, the founders of the company knew that at $75 to $85, they were already getting a great deal. They were selling their shares at a great deal, at $75 to $85. But because there was so much hype around the, the company, they realized that there were a lot of suckers out there who wanted the shares so badly that they raised the offer price to $120. I mean, if some sucker's willing to pay $120, let's sell $120. And so the offer price was eventually $120. And when the share price opened on the first day, it jumped to $240, which means... A lot of idiots are overpaying for the stock. Does it make sense? All right, so $80 is 
is the, the most that someone should pay. Now, I'm not going to buy this share because like I said, in the first place, I don't think it's a great business. If Even if it was, I would pay more than 80 bucks. But again, 80 bucks is still expensive, okay? And if you ask me, what would it take to get it undervalued? The PSG ratio needs to come down to 0 0.3 to 0 0.4. Because if it doesn't, I might as well buy Amazon and Alphabet. Like, why would I buy Snow and pay 3.5 PSG when I can buy these three great companies with consistent sales and profits and cash flows? They are proven business models where I can pay 0 0.3 PSG. It doesn't make sense. So for Snow to get to their attractiveness, the PSG has to go to 0 0.3, which means this share price should be divided by 10 which means 23.8. <laughs> That's right. So I'm telling you that Snow's only going to be undervalued at below $24 because 80 is really expensive as well. Okay. And I'm speaking not as a trader, but as an investor. Remember, as a trader, you want to buy, go ahead. Because in trading, it's buy high, sell higher. It's the greatest, the greater fool's game, right? If you buy it, the current price two three eight. You're a fool, but it's okay if you can sell it to a bigger fool willing to pay a higher price. That's that's trading. You put a stop loss, but for investing, you know I wouldn't pay more than eighty dollars to twenty three point eight dollars. Right. So having said that, let me show you something interesting as well. If you look at Facebook, okay, so Facebook listed almost ten years ago. All right, and Facebook has been a success story. Now, when Facebook first listed their revenue was growing at 80% as well, 80 to 100% revenue growth. But if you look at Facebook's historical price to sales ratio, this is the price to sales ratio, right? Which is the same as uh, market cap divided by revenues, it's the same thing. You can see the highest it ever went was 24. 24. Think about that. Facebook, right the highest price to sales ratio it ever went was 24 but for snow it's 165 it's insane it's a freaking bubble okay and eventually the bubble may burst if it bursts like i said if it goes below 23 dollars don't be surprised okay like i said when facebook first started its revenue growth was over 80 percent and then, of course, over time, the, the revenue slows down to 60% growth and 40% growth. And Snow's projected growth revenue is only about 50%. Okay? And again, if you look at the share price, like what I mentioned, if you were as lucky as Berkshire Hathaway or the early shareholders that managed to buy the offer price of 120 good for you, right? Because when it opened... At 245, that was a huge 100% pop. I would take profits immediately. I'll get out, right? But would I buy on the opening opening price of 245? I wouldn't, right? Would I buy today? Right now it's at 238. I wouldn't, right? So I'll watch it for a while. I'll look at this stock. Let's see how it goes. Let's look at the next one, two, three, four years, and let's see, you know, how it pans out. But I wanted to show you in this video how to be smart in trading or investing in IPO. So remember, just because it's an IPO, it doesn't mean it's a great business, it doesn't mean the price is gonna go up, and it doesn't mean you're getting in at a good price. In fact, most of the time, IPOs are overpriced. So hope you've learned something here. If you've got questions, ask them in the comment section, and this Adam Koo made a market speed with you. So if you wanna be the first to get my next video on YouTube, do click the subscribe button right now. If you want to check out my online courses, go on to piranaprofits.com where you can enroll in our professional forex, stock trading, options trading, and value momentum investing courses where you're going to learn how to trade like a professional and generate an income anywhere in the world. If you would like to come to Singapore to attend my live classes, Wealth Academy, go on to wealthacademyglobal.com. It's Adam Koo and may the markets be with you.